All right, church, how are we doing this morning? Oh, let's stand up and worship the Lord this morning. You guys excited to be here? I said, are you excited to be here? All right, come on, hands up like this. Rejoice and be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. And this is where I believe that you are more than enough, more than enough for me. Because you are faithful, you are faithful to your promise, you are strong when I am weak. I'm standing in your presence. I have everything I need. Come on, the joy. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's more than a feeling. The joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So hold my soul. Hold my soul. Bless his name. Oh, Joy of the Lord, the joy of the oh, Lord God. is my oh, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Jesus, come on me. You are worthy of all, worthy of all my praise. You are faithful to your promise. You are strong. 
so glad that God is so good I think a lot of times we focus on what's not good (laughs) and what you focus on you eventually become you know what you magnify is what you see clearly and I just you know we were in prayer this morning and a little kid you're going to see a little bit later on the video but he said, he chose our word for the day. And we, after prayer, we pray before the service and we huddle up and the men don't like it because they don't like to talk. But, you know, I make them say it pretty loud and we huddle up and we put our hands in. I'm like, what's the word today? And he thought for a little bit, you know, he had a lot of opportunity and then he said, joy, mm. joy. Like, so I hope today, whether you are a first time guest or you've been here, 5,000 times. Hope that you have the joy of the Lord. Or at least that you see the joy of the Lord. You would know the joy of the Lord because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so if you feel weak today, then change your focus. Fix your focus on the joy of the Lord. What is the joy of the Lord? Jesus, who for the joy set before him, went to the cross willingly, died in your place, So the joy of the Lord is Jesus. And so that's why the purpose of this church, the mission of this church, is to love Jesus, love people, and then go out and live our purpose, which is to tell people about the joy of the Lord. And so if you are a first-time guest, I would encourage you to fill out a Connect card. You can get one at the Connect counter, or there's a QR code right there. Scan that, because when you fill that out today, we are going to give $5 on your behalf to our local ministry partner and this month it is Backpack Buddies and this is a organization we partner with with the um, Wake County school system and we actually partner with a school a local school I think it's Harris Creek and um, we pack bags of food for children who may not get food on the weekends and so it's pretty amazing it's a cool ministry many of you have packed bags and been a part of that and so If you do that today, if you fill out that Connect card, $5 goes there. I also want to share this with you because this is our generosity moment. And thank you so much for so many of you who worship God through your giving, through your generosity. And you can do that in so many ways around here. You you can scan the QR code. You can go online. You can go on our app, download that app. You can go on our website. You can give on your way out. But I wanted to mention that next summer in July... I'm not giving you the dates yet, but I just I want the Lord to kind of speak to you if, if you'd lean in. But in July, we're going to begin partnering with 124 Project, and we're actually going to open up to Vision a family mission trip. So this is for families. So 
we're going to go to Mexico. And this might be something where you don't have to decide today. But I know when you put your yes on the table, and you say, God, send me wherever, I'm open to it anyway. And let the Lord work on you. And so begin praying about that. Um, after the service, and I'm not sure if it's both services, I see Rebecca. Rebecca, I know you don't want any spotlight, but can you come here just so people can see who you are? Rebecca and Ellis are members here. Yeah, come on. Either way, you can come on, you can stay down, whatever you want to do. Um, there she is. And so, um, but this is Rebecca, and her and her husband Ellis um, are leading this project, at least at Vision. And so, after the service, if you're interested, uh, or you want to talk to her about it, she'll be here. So you can head out there and you can actually, um, she might be in the lobby or she could be in the living room. And so she'll be there uh, for this Sunday and next Sunday um, because there's an informational meeting that we are going to have. And if you're just interested, you can come to that. You don't, It's not a commitment. It's just to hear more about it. That's going to be on September 15th um, after the second service. And so um, I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to Ellis. Um, and our newly formed missions team. Um, is, is there anybody else that's here from that team? I just wanted to, to recognize you. There's Mandy Taylor. Mandy's a part of that team as well. Um, and we have a few other people that are probably going to be here in the second service. But um, So we have a missions team now that's um, overseeing missions of vision. So that's exciting, right? So this is one of many that we're going to be offering in 2025, we're hoping. And so... Um, but there's opportunities to begin serving and raising money for this that it's amazing opportunities. I'm not even going to share it yet, but um, go talk to her after the service. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to just pray now. We're going to hop in this song. So, Father God, thank you so much for um, just for being who you are. As I was standing there, God, you heard my heart and you heard my mind. And I don't want this just to be a Sunday in the American church where we sing our four songs, we hear a message, and then we never experience the presence of God. And God, I'm not asking for a feeling this morning. I'm not asking for goosebumps. I'm not asking for even tears, although I know that you are an emotional God, that you feel and felt these things and these are very real and you move us to emotions God but I am I am I'm asking and begging God I'm asking for your Holy Spirit the presence of the Almighty God to land in this spot right now in this house God I want you to saturate every chair every ounce of atmosphere in this house and reign over it God dwell with us sit with us God and our response is to worship you and and, and that's going to be that's going to be meaning to sit with you to be in your presence not to be programmed this morning not to not to hold back anything from you I pray that we lavish lavish our generosity on you this morning God whatever that may look like whatever that may be I pray for boldness in your people today I, I pray for a presence and a movement that happens and starts right now in this place God Holy Spirit have your way your will your mind done today not ours God take us out of the equation and just do what you would have to do through the music and through your word and through even, even the thoughts that we're thinking, God, may we, may we be sensitive to people around us. May we not just see someone who looks like they're hurting and we don't do anything about it, but may we, may we say, hey, how are you doing? Are you okay? God, move us today. May this house, may this church be one that you are pleased with. May it not be a Laodicean church where we're just a little lukewarm, that we're a little apathetic. May we be on fire, God. Start something inside of us. Rekindle something. You make beauty from ashes. You did it with me. And you've done it with everybody who's given their life to you. And so today, may our worship be a sweet aroma to you. May we not be putting on a show. May we get lost in you. I love you. We need you. We're asking all these things.
Jesus, your son, our redeemer and our savior. Amen.
Yeah, can we just sing that? You guys know this song? Y'all looking at me like, no, okay. Well, then let's just sing it out. Who does? You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy. today, Father, is that there may be someone who doesn't know your worth, and maybe they're just focused on their worth. They, they can't see you because they don't even see themselves in the way you see them. So my prayer today is that your word does not fall on deaf ears. For all of us today, your word would be a lamp and a light. It's just good to stand in the presence of God. Thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for truth. Thank you for forgiveness and redemption and hope. Thank you for washing me clean. Have your way, Father. You're our shepherd. Lead us. Lead us beside the still waters. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, just hug one person. Just hug one person and tell them them God is good this morning. One person, one person is all it takes. Just one. Just find your one. Just find your one. Good morning, church. Welcome to Vision. We're so excited that you're here today. My name is Damien. I'm here to bring you some announcements this morning. First off, next Monday kicks off our 4919 week. This is the week where we'll be the hands and feet of Jesus in our 4919 community. Uh, there'll be places and events that we are going to volunteer from Monday all the way to Friday. There's events in the morning, there's events at nighttime, there's events for families. There's so many ways that we are going to serve our community and it's all gonna lead to a night of worship led by Triangle City Worship on that Friday night to celebrate just a great week of being servants. But also that week for our college and career ministry that we are kicking off, that is for everyone between the ages of 18 and 25, there's gonna be a taco night that night on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we're gonna have some tacos. Greg is gonna show you guys kind of what he has in store, what God has in store for us for a new ministry. It's gonna be awesome. You don't wanna miss that out. And then if you're new here, uh, we, we just, thank you so much for being here and giving us an opportunity. If you've been coming for a little bit, we're so glad you still choose Vision as your church home. 
Our next step of be making Vision Your Church home is to join us on Inside Mission, which is on September 22nd, which will follow second service. This is gonna be a time where we uh, have a meal together, but also we get to talk about and find out the vision of Vision. You get to meet some leaders, uh, staff, we get to find out what Vision stands for, and it's your next step before becoming a member of this awesome church. Today, Pastor Chris is continuing his Sermon on the Mount series. We are so excited for that, and we're so excited that you're here. Hope you guys have a blessed and a safe Labor Day weekend. All right, lots going on at Vision. I, I can't tell you um, how important it is to download the app, subscribe to the What's Happening email. Um, so important with all the things going on, we're going to miss some announcements. And so uh, that, that's right there in your pocket. Go ahead and download that and stay up to date. Next week, not this one coming up, but the following week, uh, 4919. So if you haven't signed up to serve, this is your opportunity. Some events have already filled up. And so um, make sure that you go online and go on the app and sign up to serve with you and your family. I wanted to you know, I mentioned the missions team, and I, I didn't, um, I just want you, I don't know if I've already introduced them, um, but I'm going to just tell you some names, and I'll probably miss one, so if, if you're on the team, just help me out. But I, I mentioned Mandy Taylor, and then um, Ellis and Rebecca Eady, um, John and Chris Fields, um, Ryan and Christy Copley, and Karen Patterson-Smith, as she is called. That's good. Um, so that's our missions team. So you guys pray for them, and um, it's going to be amazing to see what God does in the life of our church. God is doing so much. We got so many pregnant people here, and um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> one of the blessings of being married um, and um, the blessings of God is children, unless you're Brandon, who now has five. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but pray for Brandon. Wendy is uh, pregnant, and any, he's like, the, my phone is on loud because um, it's any second. And so thanks for being here. Shout out to Wendy. Do the thing. And um, <laughs> Miranda's in the back because she thought la last week that there might be something, and so she's ready. So we got, we got more. They're on the way. So i um, excited that you're here. We're in a series going through Jesus' first recorded sermon. So like, if you're a follower of Jesus, or if you're trying to figure out, is Jesus somebody I should follow, his first words to people are pretty important, right? And so he goes on this mountain, and he, he begins, and we're in Matthew chapter 5, and we preach through the Beatitudes, blessed, blessed, blessed. And do you remember what Jesus said? He said some very uh, challenging, difficult things, didn't he? I mean, things like, Blessed are those who are broken, broke, poor in spirit. Uh, blessed are the humble and meek, not the assertive and proud. Well, how's that going to help if I just sit back and we talked about that? He said, blessed are the peacemakers. And this one really was a problem because the Old Testament had said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And some of you lived that motto, Right. Like if somebody starts something with you, you're going to finish it. And, but, but Jesus comes on the scene and flips the script and he says, no, 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 make peace with them, especially if they're your enemies, especially if they're not Jewish. And it's like, what? That's not what the law says. That's not what the scripture said. That's not what God says. Because the scripture said if somebody hurt you, you can hurt them. He calls people, we saw last week, the light of the world. And that was a term for rabbis. But he looks at jacked up, broken people, people who weren't as educated, people who were common people, kind of like me and you. And, and he says, now you're the light of the world. And the rabbis and the teachers and the, the leaders and the religious people, they had a problem with Jesus saying this stuff. Because if we're not careful, it sounds like Jesus is anti-scripture. And Jesus is even anti-God because it's God's scripture. And he is now, he's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what the scriptures say, but. And, and so if we're not careful, Jesus might appear not to love God and definitely not love what the religious leaders of the day was teaching. I mean, Jesus was hanging out with the ragamuffins. 
the misfits, the outcasts. I like to think of them as the people of vision. No offense. Like, like that's kind of who we are. We're a bunch of misfit toys, right? And, and so it's cool. If, if you're here and you're, you're like, what? Like, welcome. Like, join us. Because we're not your churchy, everyday American church people. Like, no offense to those people, but we're actually real and we share things and we're not trying to dress up and put on a fake show. Like, we are broken, messy, jacked up people. And this is who Jesus hung with. And so the people of that day hated him and despised him, especially if they were Jewish and trying to love God because why is he hanging out with all the sinners? And so Jesus says something very important. He's just taught all this stuff, remember. And in verse 17 of Matthew 5, he says this, Don't think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them. I've actually come to fulfill them. Jesus looks at the people and says, I know what you're thinking. You think that I'm trying to rewrite scripture. You think I'm taking out the parts of scripture or adding to the parts of scripture or canceling the scripture and the, what the prophet said. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not coming to do that. I'm not, can, I'm not canceling the law. I'm not abolishing the law. I'm just coming after your law. Man's law. Man's traditions. Man's preferences. Man's version of the scriptures. And when he says the law, he means the whole revelation of God. The, the whole Bible. Remember at this time now, there's no New Testament. We're just dealing with the Old Testament. And he didn't come to abolish it. He didn't say it's not, not relevant because that's what the church wants to say today. Don't worry about the Old Testament. That doesn't matter. You just need Jesus. You just need Jesus. Don't worry about what God used to say. And Jesus is like, hold up, church. That's not right. Because I'm a fulfillment of the Old Testament. See, in other words, every time you read Scripture, every time you read any Scripture, any passage, in its context, it should point you to the main point. And Jesus is saying, the main point is Him. The Old Testament's main point, Jesus. It's a shadow of what's to come. Who's to come? Jesus. Why did, they, why did they do the Passover where they spread the blood over the doorposts of a sinless lamb? And when they spread it, the blood dripped down in the shape of a cross. What's that pointing to? It's pointing to the spotless lamb of God who would shed his blood one day on a cross so that Passover would no longer be, need to be recognized there in that way. Everything points to Jesus, and I think we miss this in America. I think we miss this right now in this church. I think we miss this as followers of Jesus. Jesus is looking at us and saying, you're not the main point. We're not the main character of our story. See, we open the word, and what do we want? We, were to, we want a word for us. We want to look how this is relevant to me. We come to church, and I want to be all up in my fields. I want the message to speak to me. I want the songs to speak to me. I want to sit in my seat because this is the way I worship. Because when I can worship that way, then I can feel God. I can be in his presence. I can hear from God. And when we pray, what are we praying for? God, meet my need. God, answer my prayer. God, I, I want you to do it. God, I need your help. All, all those prayers start with the same word, I. Why? Because we're focused on us. Church isn't about us. The Bible's not about us. We're not the main character of our prayers or our life. You work, it shouldn't be about you. You have relationships, you have a marriage, you're a family. Like, none of it is about us. And this is what Jesus is saying. 
Every time we open the word, every time we gather together, you know, you get up in the morning and you do your little verse of the day, you get on your you version app, you, you journal, whatever it is, like whenever you do this, every time you get in here, stop looking for you and start looking for him. Tara Lee Cobble in the Bible recap calls it her God shot. Some of you are doing that this year. It's amazing because she's teaching that when you read scripture, know, know the context, know the story. Yes, it can apply to you, but the main thing you should be looking for is who God is. And what is he, what is he doing? And what has he done? Look for God. When you pray, look for God. Long for God. And Jesus is saying, hey, this matters. Because this is about me. And I'm the point of you. And I'm the point of it. And this is where we struggle. This is going to be more of a teaching point sermon today. Okay? But we struggle with this. Let's just take off the little mask and the church stuff. We struggle with this. We struggle reading it. We struggle obeying it. And we struggle believing it. And we're bored by it. See, the problem is we live in a world that God has given the enemy dominion over. Dominion is a strong word. He's given him reign over right now. Any control that the enemy has is given by God and allowed by God. And so... The enemy is really good at twisting God's words and making people believe something that might not be exactly what God is saying. He's so good at it that it will get in pastor's ears. And pastors will start preaching things that sound like truth. And to the immature believer... To the person who doesn't read and study and know, they'll start believing lies. And this is the problem with this, is that we have a culture now in America that doesn't know what truth is. Truth, we are taught, is relative. If you believe what you believe, then that's your truth. This is what we're taught. But Jesus says, he is truth. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. And so he says, hey, look, this matters. And just in case you're thinking it doesn't, he goes on in verse 18 and he says, for truly I say to you, or amen. He says, until heaven and earth pass away. And by the way, the heavens and the earth are going to be obliterated destroyed. They will pass away. We will not know this earth and that heaven, but there is coming a new heaven and a new earth that God will establish, a new kingdom. But Jesus says, until that happens, not an iota, that's the smallest Hebrew letter, not an iota, not, not one little, or not a dot, and you think a dot, and that's, that's not a bad way to think about it, but it's more like an apostrophe. Or if you think of the letter C, what's the difference between a C and a G? It's that one dash. Jesus is saying, that's how serious this word, he says, not a, an iota, not a dot, will pass from this law until it's all accomplished. Which shows us that the Bible is the authority to determine what is true. Not your feelings. And not the world. And not what you think God should do. Jesus is saying every word in this, every word in your scriptures is pure, it's inerrant, and it's infallible. It's true. Jesus stood on the word, believed the word, used the word of God often. And it is permanent. I mean, this stands the test of time, literally. Jesus, in other words, is saying, 
We should always trust God's word. Watch, because God is the word. I want you to think about this. John 1, 1. In the beginning, the very beginning. So how beginning? Like the beginning. Nothing's before the beginning. You understand that? That's just English. Okay. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now, it wasn't in print version at this time, but the word of God was God and was with God. He knew everything. The word says that he knew you before you were even thought of. So at the very beginning, God has established the word and he is the word. And watch this, verse 14 of John 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that mean? Jesus Christ, the word of God. And so some of you struggle with this. This message really is for those who, who are struggling with parts or all of this. You can trust God's word because the word is God. And it doesn't matter if you Feel it? Or if you want to say, well, maybe he didn't mean that. Or maybe, maybe that was just for that time. And we've got to know context. And we've got to understand. And we need to study and have accountability. And we need to grow in our groups and be taught. But what's happened is we've let our feelings trump the word of God. Example. Some of you can't forgive, I'll just leave it at that. You can't forgive what happened to you. You can't forgive the person or the situation. You can't forgive God. You are holding on to bitterness, anger, frustration, and you can't forgive. So, so if that's you, can I tell you what you're doing? You would rather stay in unforgiveness than obedience. That's what you're saying. You would rather sit in your anger. Some of you are victims today. And you play the victim card. And it's not that the situation wasn't real. And it's not that the situation didn't hurt you and cause bad things. But like God has set you free from that. God has given you what to do and how to handle that. And it's still hard and it's a process. And all that makes sense. But some of you enjoy sitting in your hurt. Or sitting in your unforgiveness. Or sitting in your anger, right? You'd rather sit in your feelings than walk in obedience and watch you know what happens? You have fallen trapped to emotional idolatry. You'd rather feel it than believe truth. You don't want to forgive. You want to stay angry because you like being angry way more than you like reconciling with that person. That's just one example. You want to sit in your emotions rather than sit in the presence of God. Jesus says, as long as you're on this earth, as long as my kingdom has not come, you depend and you trust in this. And this is what we have a problem with because this is a problem for people. Because you're... I mean, if I'm sitting here listening to this message, I'm thinking, okay, Chris, but this was written by men. And what about all the errors? Or the, or the places that don't line up perfectly? It, is it really inspired by God if it's, that, like, if it's that old? Like, how do we know? How do we know that this hasn't been changed? How do we know? Chris, how do I know? I just can't trust this. I just want to try and, some of you are very uh, logical and you like to study and learn. And so this is the part of the education 
Um, right now, I'm going to teach a little bit. But do you understand how this was written? Like, it wasn't just a guy just writing everything down and saying, believe this. I want to I wanna just give you some, a little bit of history on why you can trust that this is God's word. Here's how we got the Bible. Here's how this was transcribed. This was copied. Um, the Bi- and I just want to take the New Testament to begin with. They were copied by scribes. You heard this. Now, each scribe had to put on ceremonial dress. I'm talking more than a suit and tie. Just, just ridiculous outfit. No offense to the scribes out there. But they had, to, they had to do this, and they had to be in a perfect location. Complete silence. Each scroll that they wrote on, or papyra, it, it had to have a certain number of lines per inch. Now think about this. And the margins had to be perfect on each side. We can't appreciate this because we have computers that do this for us. They had to do this with each scroll. Okay, I I hear you doubting. The distance between each letter, not each word, each letter had to be the same on the scroll for every letter. They wrote the words by letter, not words. They didn't look at the whole word. They took a letter at a time. The scroll had to be a perfect width, a perfect color, uh, and, and skin from a perfect animal. And it was copied very slowly. They wrote from right to left, not left to right. And the writing had to end perfectly. There were no hyphens. It had to end perfectly on the line. Or it was a mistake with that margin. Because, I don't know about you, remember in school when you're trying to get something to fit on one line, you start cramping the word smaller and smaller at the end just to make it fit? They couldn't do that. They couldn't do that. After they were finished... If there were more than three pages of mistakes, they threw it all out. It had to start over. Like, if one page had one mistake, that's one. If three of them, it's out. I, I'm just telling you this because that's how they copied the manuscripts. That's how we got the Word of God. Very meticulous. Yeah, Chris, but men wrote it. Okay, okay. If that's your argument, then do not read another book. Don't even go to school. Now, kids, you got to go to school because your parents say that. But I'm just saying, if you can't believe, you can't believe it because men wrote it, then don't you dare believe anything you read in a book or a magazine or on Google or the Internet or TikTok or anything because men are writing it. Yeah, but they're... And here's the other thing is that do you realize how many manuscripts we have of God's Word? Like, not only is it the number one bestseller today, I'm talking about original manuscripts. Like, we're quick to believe about Julius Caesar. I say that name, you know that name. We have 10 original manuscripts of Julius Caesar to know anything about him. 10. And we are teaching it in schools and believing it. No one doubts that Julius Caesar existed and did what he did. He was a Rome dictator. Or Plato. You heard of Plato? Plato. I, he, he was one of the most important philosophers to ever live. Seven original manuscripts. Seven. Aristotle, his poetics, five. The closest one to the Bible that we have is the Iliad written by Homer. 634 manuscripts, and nobody doubts any of these The Bible, only 24,000, actually a little over 24,000 manuscripts. I'm just giving you facts right now. Like, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, but aren't there errors or differences in the Bible? Yes. Yes, there are. A leading New Testament scholar by the name of Dan Wallace did a lot of years of studying, a lot of research, and and he's not the only one, but many scholars. You know how many 
how many of these differences are just because of a word spelled differently or because of the article the? Like um, the, uh, the love, uh, the, one jo- the one Jesus loved or one Jesus loved, the word the is the only missing out of that. 99.5% of the differences in the Bible are either spelling or just one little article. Does it, it doesn't make any difference in a meaning or a context or anything. Well, what about the 0.5%? There we go. That's how we know that this isn't God's word. Okay, I want to show you an example because there's only a few. 0.5, right? Not a lot. Look at this verse. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. On the left, But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Look at the older manuscript. But we were like infants among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Do you want to know the difference between gentle and infants? Yeah, there's a difference. Okay. Listen, it's one iota. Remember what Jesus said? Not a, not a dot, not an iota. The difference between those two words in the language was one letter. Here's, here's my point. Listen to me. Don't miss this. This is not just a, a class that you're taking. Don't miss this. Think about what I'm saying. We have three different languages represented in this. Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. Okay? Three different cultures. We have three different continents that this was written. Asia, Africa, and Europe. Over 40 authors, 40 people written over probably a period of about 1,500 years. And none of the differences, none of the interpretations by the different authors, none of the cultural backgrounds, none of them affect doctrine or salvation or the validity of the Bible at all. That is a miracle. Yeah, yeah, but how do we know that this is the word of God? How do we know that this is the inspired word of God? Couldn't just a bunch of men write that over 1,500 years and three, con- I mean, you see how ridiculous it sounds when you say it. Couldn't over 40 people just get together in three different continents back then with no phones and no electricity? And I mean, you see how ridiculous it sounds, right? But maybe you still struggle. I just don't know that this is the word of God. Peter addresses this to a people who were doubting just like you. And he says this in 2 Peter chapter 1. In verses 16 and 18, before we get to this, verses 16 and 18, he says, okay, you can believe what I'm telling you because I was an eyewitness. I walked with Jesus. We were eyewitnesses. We talked with Jesus. We saw Jesus. We were on the Mount of Transfiguration, man. It was amazing. There was a spirit. We actually saw what we're telling you, what we're recording. But Peter knows that maybe they're lying. Like that he, 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 maybe the church is thinking, mm, he's lying. Okay? So Peter says this in verse 19 of 2 Peter chapter 1. We have the prophetic word that's an important word there prophetic we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first of all check it out no prophecy of scripture comes from somebody's own interpretation For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. You better be very careful speaking for the Lord. Let me say this very clearly. We got some people who believe that they hear from the Lord, they know from the Lord, it is direct communication from the Lord, and they will speak for the Lord. And sometimes what they speak for the Lord does not come to pass, which proves it is not prophecy. I'm just saying, you better let the word of God do the speaking for the Lord. Read it out loud to somebody. You might be given something. And I believe this happens. I believe you can get a word for somebody, but you just better be very careful in how you communicate it to people because people will hold on to your words. If, you say, if I look at my boy Brandon and I say, hey, the word, the word of God, let me tell you something, man. I was praying and the Lord told me you will have that baby today. He's going, 
He's, now he's going home. Wendy, get ready. It's happening today. What happens if that doesn't happen? My validity's question, my relationship with the Lord's question, now maybe he and his wife might be doubting who God is. I'm just saying, be careful how you communicate that you have heard from the Lord. You might feel it. You might want it. Too many times our preferences and our way and what we want happen, and we, we disguise that by the word of the Lord. Be very careful what you speak. No prophecy of Scripture comes from somebody's own interpretation. Verse 21. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried by the Holy Spirit. This is the proof. Prophecy. Now, do I believe? You're going to ask me. I don't know how you believe. I don't know what you believe about sign gifts. And we have, the amazing thing is that we can be filled with a church that believe all different things about these gifts. And we can still worship together. And we still can be unified as a church. But prophecy is speaking the word of God. And so, a few years ago, listen to this. The National Enquirer put out an article called Modern Day Prophets. And they ask movie stars, politicians, um, sports uh, athletes, famous people, that they ask them to get together and make 61 predictions about what's going to happen in six months. Like, we could get together and we could decide from now until December, what do we think is going to happen? You can do that in any part of your life, right? Predict. Okay, so all these people got together to talk about what's going to happen in six months to make 61 predictions. And they did it. So they waited six months. And you want to know how many of them came true? How many of their predictions, prophecies came true? Zero. Zero. Now the Bible, now check this, the Bible records hundreds of prophecies. And the messianic prophecies, the ones about the Messiah, they've been fulfilled. Listen, this, please God, open our ears and our minds and our hearts and our eyes to this. The Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, predicted way before Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. The Messiah will be born of a virgin, not possible, only with God, happened. Some of these prophecies are about Jesus' death. Now check this out. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. I don't have time to read through it. I want you to read through it. This was written by David a thousand years. Hear, hear this, hear this. A thousand years before Jesus. So David writes this psalm. And there was no, there was no, chapters and verse numbers when he wrote Psalm 22. So it wasn't Psalm 22. Do you want to know the name of the song? Psalm a thousand years before the crucifixion? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Does that sound familiar? That is exactly what Jesus said on the cross. He goes on and says, my strength is dried up. My tongue sticks to my jaws. I thirst. They've pierced my hands and my feet. I, I count all my bones. Not a, not a bone was broken. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments and cast lots for my clothes. 1,000 years before Jesus was crucified, David 
is writing about the crucifixion. Listen to me. Crucifixion didn't even happen until a thousand years after Psalm 22. Prophecy. Isaiah, Isaiah 53. 700 years before Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Well, I just, I don't know. Listen, in 1948, a huge miracle happened. 1948, that, that's a little more relevant to us that you think, right? 1948. Because up until 1948, the oldest copies of God's Word, the manuscripts, they were 900 years after the crucifixion, after Jesus died. A lot can happen in 900 years, right? That's a problem. 1948, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. It's a miracle. These, actually, these boys were throwing rocks in these caves. Or pennies. or I forget what it was, but they threw it, and it made a different sound. So they got up there, and they got all the... All these manuscripts to God's Word. In fact, whole books of the Bible were discovered. The whole book of Isaiah. Think about this. 700 years before Jesus, we've got the documents that were written 700 years before Je predicting, predicting. And so you've got all these manuscripts from 900 years after, and now... We ha that it has been proven the Dead Sea Scrolls were written a hundred years before Jesus' birth. That's a thousand years in between. All lining up. All the prophecies fulfilled. All the predictions coming true. And they all point to Jesus. This is not normal. This is supernatural. This is impossible to do on your own. Um, I, there was a mathematician in California. He was a head of, of some um, department in the college. And he wanted to prove how hard it is for prophecies to come true. So he took eight messianic prophecies. Just eight of them. Prophecies about Jesus. And he's, he did some studying and some formulas. And he figured out how difficult it would be to complete just eight of these prophecies. What are the odds? You ready for the odds? One in 100 trillion. Which is the equivalent of taking the state of Texas, filling it up with one and a half feet of quarters, marking one of those quarters, blindfolding you and telling you to go pick out the one that I marked and you getting it. The whole state. That's how difficult it would be to fulfill just eight. And hundreds. Hundreds. Because I'm, I'm telling you this because some of us treat this, treat God's word like it's just there. And it is a miracle. And it has exactly what you need. And it's not how to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It's not where to go to college or what to do or how to save my marriage. It's Jesus. He's what we need. If you reject the Bible, you reject Jesus. That's why Jesus in verse 19 of Matthew 5 says, Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How you handle this, how you read this, how you teach this or speak this, what you do with God's word is building you an eternal reward. There are levels of hell and there are levels of heaven. This is proof that there's an eternal reward waiting for you, for those who handle the word of God, know the word of God, believe the word of God. We have to handle this carefully. I was watching, well, I actually was just scrolling through Instagram. And I, listen, I, I'm not calling out anybody, but somebody posted something, shared something on their story that appeared to be Christ-like. Because it was a politician, I'm not gonna say who, it was a politician who started talking about how God reveals himself best. And it was in the wilderness. Maybe you've seen it. And he talks about how 
Um, the wilderness, Moses was in the wilderness and God's people were in the wilderness and even he said Gandhi and, and Buddha had to go through wilderness, right? And God reveals himself in the winter wilderness and then he said this at the end, even to Jesus Christ, God's son, because it was in the wilderness that Jesus learned and, and, and grew in his divinity. And I was like, whoa, 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 he learned about being God? And I see Christians posting this, like people... That's, that love Jesus, but they don't know the truth. They have taken TikTok and made it their truth. And this is what's happening today to the church. We are watching TikTok, Instagram. We are getting up all in our fields, and it sounds good, and we think it'll follow, and it's been shared by everybody, so I must share it. And we share something that is totally inaccurate. And Jesus says, be very careful how you handle God's Word, you cannot take a casual approach. And just to make sure nobody's confused, he ends in verse 20 and says, I tell you, unless your righteousness, your righteousness, my righteousness, it exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Listen, the scribes, that was their job to know with their head and their, their job to know with their hands. Don't miss this. This is a big aha moment. The scribes knew with their head the word of God and they wrote with their hands the word of God. The Pharisees, that wasn't their job to be a Pharisees. This was a sect, a movement. And they were focused on the formal parts, the traditions. They knew the word better than anybody and, and they did the word better than anybody. But Jesus says, unless you're better than the scribes and the Pharisees, you ain't making it to heaven. Which is very deflating until you get what he's saying. The only thing better than knowing God and knowing God's word with your head and knowing God and doing God's word with your hands is knowing God and knowing God's word with your heart. See, it's not just about how much do you know with your head or how much can you do with your hands, how much can you serve at church and how much can you be generous and how much can we memorize and how much Bible knowledge can we have and how many facts can we know. Jesus says, I, I wash all that away. It's important, but the main thing is heart change. Not head change, not hand change, heart change. Because when the heart changes, the head changes and the hands change. Otherwise, You'll just start reading the Bible and it's exhausting. You'll come to church and it's exhausting. You don't want to be here. You don't want to do these things. It'll feel like God's a judge and a, you got to follow a bunch of rules. And if that's you, I would say check your heart. That's what Jesus' point is. He doesn't just want your hands and your head. He is after something greater. I know many husbands who are here in this church only because their wives are making them. Or they feel that way anyway. I know many wives who are in this church only because their husbands have set that expectation. Or students. And the truth is, we got a lot of people who are walking around, like I said last week, libraries full of knowledge. But they're not living it out. And we got a lot of people who love the church, but they don't love Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey, you can try all you want. But until you realize that I've done everything and you just give up and follow me, you're just going to live an exhausted, unsettled life. And you ain't going to make it. See, if you can get the truth into your head, God will get his word in your heart. How are you doing trusting God? This is, this is the end. How are you doing trusting God? Not that he is God. And not that Jesus was sent and salvation. Great. And that is the most important. Right? But while you're on this earth, you can't live for God on your own. You have the helper, the Holy Spirit. You have God's word. How are you doing trusting God? Him and His ways and His law. Old Testament, New Testament, all of it. 
How are you doing with your generosity? Do you trust God or not? How are you doing with your time? Do you trust God or not? How are you doing healing what's broken? Do you trust God or not? How are you doing at forgiving? Do you trust God or not? How, how are you doing parenting your children the way God says? Do you trust God or not? How are you doing prioritizing God over everything else? Do you trust him or not? How are you doing being obedient to what he's called you to do today? Do you trust him or not? Dads, how are you doing parenting your kids in a godly way, growing up young men and young women that love Jesus, prioritizing Jesus? Are you, are you trusting God with your children or not? Husbands and wives, are you trusting God with your marriage or are you trying to fix it? Or are you trying to be better? Are you walking on eggshells? You're not a peace, uh, peacemaker, you're a peacekeeper and you just don't want, how are you doing being the man God called you to be, the woman God called you to be? I, I don't care if your season is hard or if your season is easy. Do you trust God? That's it. Do you trust him? And if the answer is yes, then you gotta trust his word because this is he, this is him. He is right here. You wanna know God? You wanna know where to go? You wanna know what to do? You go to him. You depend on him. Psalm 119, I have stored up your word in my heart. Why do we store up God's word? Why do we memorize every week or every, every month? Man, so that I won't sin against God. Some of you are walking in sin because the word is not in you. Get in the Word so the Word gets into you. All right, I'm closing. Don't come up, worship team. I'm closing. This is practical, okay? I know you're going to want to maybe write this, but just get focused and watch. This is the problem, is that we might be inspired to start, and we might want to go, okay, I want to start reading. I want to know. I want, but then we walk out, and we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. I had a guy um, text me who watches online, doesn't come here regularly, text me. He's like, I know God's speaking to me, but I don't know how to start reading my Bible. I, I, I just, I try, and then I'm just lost. And, you know, if you, try to, if you try a Bible reading plan and you get to Leviticus, you're like, I'm done. I don't get it. It's just, you know what I mean? And if you've got a version you don't understand, it's like, uh, what am I reading? Where do I start? Okay, I want to help you. I want to help you become better, better Bible scholars, okay? If you, if you want to learn this, if you want, I'm going to give you some simple, practical tips. Number one, and this is the most important, I believe. Ready? Study the scriptures with others. Now watch. Leave it up there. Let people write it down. It would be cool if this church would start a bunch of Bible clubs. Here's what I mean. These three girls right here, they say, man, I want to I start studying the scripture. I want to know God's word better, I wanna, I, but I, I need help. Because I know me, I know me, I'll start and then I'll just kind of get distracted or I'll get busy or I don't have any accountability. So these three are saying, hey, we're going to start a Bible club or a Bible team, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. Girls going Bible, right? Okay, so <laughs> that's an actual thing, right? Isn't that thing? Yeah, okay. So what do you do? You can go, listen to me. Listen to me. We get so enamored by the progress we're making. What if the progress that God wants is just one verse at a time? Like, if you go from zero to one, that's incredible. And so if you're just starting out, find three, two, three, four, five people I would say no less than th three total. That will do this with you, okay? And choose what you can do every day. So if it's a verse a day, so be it. And you start, <laughs> you're not going to believe what I opened up to, um, the Song of Solomon. I would not, I would not recommend starting with that. Um, if you're new to the Bible, <laughs> if you're new to the Bible, I would uh, choose somewhere in the New Testament. John's a good one. I mean, any of the Gospels, John. You can, you can read Matthew. We're going through it, right? So, I mean, um, but, but start there. But here's what I would do. In my group, 
I would create a group text or get an app, and I don't like group text either, but this is my group. I'd pin it, if you know how to do that, and then I would read. We, we, these girls have decided they're going to do a chronological study of the Bible. They're going to go from Genesis to Revelation, and it's not in the order that your Bible is written for most of us because we don't have a chronological Bible. So they're going to do this, but they don't have a clue. So maybe they buy those Bibles. Maybe they do the Bible recap because she goes in. Maybe there's other Bible plans on you version that they can find, but they find a Bible plan that'll work. And they say, we're just going to go a chapter at a time. It's going to take them four years. Four years. I mean, that's good, isn't it? I would rather them go four years and, and just be soaking it in than go one year and stop because then you got three more years. What are they doing, right? So they're going to take a chapter at a time. They're going to go with Genesis. They're going to read it, and they're... <laughs> And we're going to let Kaylee lead this. And Kaylee is going to share one verse from Genesis 1 that spoke, get God spoke to her today. Wait, what? You put me on the spot. I did. Welcome back. All right, so. But she said that she was created in the image of God. That was her verse. And now she texts that to her friends. And now her friends get to respond to that. And now we're soaking that word in a little bit. And that's the, word, that's the verse that we're going to focus on today. Just today. That we were made in the image of God. And so they, t- they text each other. Ooh, ooh. And, and, and then they start to be sweet, you know. Oh, Kaylee, you're so, you're so sweet like God. I, I can see God every time. Every time I'm around you because you're smiling. You have the joy of the Lord. And all of a sudden now they're growing as disciples of Christ, and they're in the Word, and they're just using the Word. One verse from a whole chapter that they read, the Bible Club, or Girls Gone Bible, as you call yourselves. Okay, so number two, memorize what God says about you. Stop letting culture define you. Stop letting others speak into you that that don't belong in your mind and in your heart. Let God, who created you, the author and finisher of you and your faith, let Him Declare over you, to you, for you, who you are. Well, I don't know. Well, here you go. Ready? Image. Boom. That's who God says about you. Sermon on the Mount. There it is. Nope. There's an image that God says about you that we created, and maybe it's going to come up, maybe it's not, but there it is. Take a picture. Go. Boom, 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 boom. That's what God says about you. Some of you need to print it out or save it on your phone and every day, like declare that over you. You're not an accident. You have, God has a plan. God loves you just the way you are. God will never leave you. God wants to be with you. The victory is for you. Heaven forever is for you. On and on. And these are just a few. But like declare these to yourself every morning. Like some of you, your rhythm needs to be to wake up and just say these over and over and over. These 10 statements. Because this is who God sees you as. God says you are. Memorize them. Because if you say them for a month, you'll start to hear them come out. And you'll start to believe them. Number three, fight your battles with Scripture. That's what Jesus did. So any battle you have going on right now, find Scripture to defend yourself. Oh, I don't know. That's why you're in a group. That's why you're in Girls Gone Bible. They're going to help you, right? And the last one. Pray scripture back to God. That's that's the good stuff. When you pray scripture back to God. God, you said in your word that you will never leave me and you will never forsake me, but I feel all alone. So I know that feeling is not from you. So God, open up my eyes and let me see what's fighting for me. And who's fighting for me? God, you declared to me, you promised me that you are turning all things for my good and your glory. All I see is evil. And this hurts. And I don't know where to go. But I'm trusting that word. You prove yourself faithful like you you always do, God. And you start declaring and praying scripture back to God you got to discipline your children and you don't want to. You ever been there? Some of you love disciplined children. I'm just saying, when you got to discipline your child, like spare the rod, spoil the child. That's a verse. It's okay, mom. It's okay, dad. This is what the word of God says. Train them up in the way they should go. 
Make them memorize. They don't want to. It ain't about what they want. You are training them to be warriors, to be princes, to be princesses for the kingdom. This matters. This church has got to be serious about this. Because this is God. This is who he is. Don't tell me you love God. You don't know him. And some of you are fighting losing battles today. But you've got the sword. Pick it up. Get in it. Dig. See what God does. How are you doing today, church? Trusting God. So, Father, we pray now. I got two, two prayers for the church today, Father. First, I want to pray for all of those who are trying so hard on their own to come to you, to be right with you, to live for you, but they have no idea who you are. I pray today that they trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, that they realize they need saving, and that Jesus Christ was sent to save them. I pray that they would believe in their heart that not only did Jesus die for them, but that he, that he raised again three days later from the dead. So I pray for salvation today. And if that's you today, I want you to know that I just said what the Bible says, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that he, will be, that he rose from the dead, then you will be saved. Not, not might be, not clean up first, no, right now, Confess that Jesus is Lord, that you need saving, that you believe he died, but you also believe he rose again. And you will be a child of God. You will be delivered from your sin. Second prayer is for the church, the Christians. How are you doing trusting God with what he said? With what he said about you? With what he said about who you are, where you're going? Trusting God. Trusting him in all situations. I pray now, as we're about to witness some baptisms, that you make some decisions for Christ today. Father, thank you for your word. I pray these things in Christ's name. Would you stand? If you're going to get baptized, this is your time. If, you, if you've never been baptized and you're saying, hey, I'm ready, come on, we got some clothes. We're ready to baptize you. Let's sing church. Let's declare the joy of the Lord in the place.
guys sit down real quick. I want to introduce you to a couple people. This is Patty. Patty, Patty um, has had a journey, a lot of nervousness and anxiety, and um, a, f- a few years ago, Patty got connected with the church and um, understood. She had the head knowledge and made sense, and there was a lot of people who were helping her in the church, and um, just really good things were happening to her, and so. Um, God was drawing her and she even was baptized and um, she understood she said she believed but even after that there was some darkness from her past um, a very abusive past childhood she couldn't she didn't want to go back to that place she didn't want to think about it, talk about it it was just dark and even if she could um, she didn't know how because it was too dark. And she described it last Saturday to me, or yes, and said, it's like I'm here and my past is over here, but there's this huge hole and this huge darkness. And I don't know how to bridge myself to go back and to forgive and to heal and to, I just don't know how to do it. So she was talking with the counselor and the counselor was working with her. And all of a sudden, Patty just had her eyes closed and she just broke. And the counselor said, I could see it the moment it happened because Patty drew it out. She drew this amazing track, by the way. She didn't even know it was a track, but it's amazing. And this big chasm, this big darkness that was in, she drew a light in the shape of a cross. And she said, that was the moment where I surrendered and I understood what true forgiveness and salvation is. That's when I got saved. And this was recently. Um, And so she came, she was telling me the story and I'm just like, like it was amazing. And she's like, I want to get baptized. She's like, I know I, but she said, but that was before. And she's like, I understand who Jesus is. I understand the cross. I understand. And I am able to forgive and love. And y'all, for somebody who doesn't want to be seen, and this is terrifying to her, and you don't, you don't know. You don't, I mean, some of you do. But like, this is huge. But she loves Jesus that much, and she loves you that much to, to say, hey, if Jesus can do it for me, he can do it for you. And so, um, Patty, is everything I just said true? It is. It is. And um, you've given your life to Jesus Christ. And you know he gave his life for you. And you're going to follow him. You believe he died and rose again for you, for your sins. And do you believe that you now have the Holy Spirit inside of you? Yes. Yes. See, baptism is a picture of what she's already professed. So this isn't saving her. But this is declaring to you who she's following. And who's radically given her new life. So it's my honor to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And see, her story impacts people because her daughter's here. She lives in Winterville. And she said, I'm coming to watch and... And my son wants to be baptized. And so I got the chance to talk to Caden. Come on, buddy. And, um, dude, this dude loves Jesus. Like, he's eight years old. He goes to a Christian school. He made sure to tell me. We got chapel every day. And I'm like, so you know? He's like, yep, I know Jesus died, right, for you. You believe he died on a cross to save you? And you're, you've given your life to him? And do you believe that he didn't stay dead? Yeah, he came back to life. That's right. And um, do you know that you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you? You do. And you're going to follow him no matter what. Yes. Well, it's going to be my honor and joy to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Hey, there's always room for more. And I want to tell you something. You're about to watch this video. I know it's long. I apologize. Um, not the video, just me. And so, so, but I want you to watch this video and uh, watch what we did this past Thursday. I had the privilege to uh, baptize uh, two brothers and um, the Hanlon boys. And so many of you know them. And it was an honor and privilege to do this. So check it out. Cole, I want to ask you a question, okay? Have you given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Yeah. And you're going to follow Jesus with, with your whole heart and with your life? Yeah. And do you know that because of your profession of faith that you're saved? Yeah. And, and do you know that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? That smile is a good indication, isn't it? Okay, but I want to ask you, is Jesus Christ your Lord? Yeah. And you're going to follow him? Yeah. And you believe in your heart? Yeah. Everything the Bible says? So we're going to baptize Cole, my brother. And I, I just want to re-emphasize this, that this is not saving Cole. Cole is already saved on the inside. And he's already professed that Jesus is his Lord. This is a symbol of his old life going under the water and coming up a brand new believer. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? And you said what? Yes. And you know that Jesus is the Son of God and that He lived the perfect life but died on the cross. And three days after He was buried, what happened? Okay. He came alive. That's right. So Cole, it's my honor and my privilege to baptize you in front of your family and friends in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, it's going to be my honor and privilege to baptize you, Kate. My brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Well, church, thank you so much for being part of this today. Make sure you love when all the new people that got baptized. This is a great first step to them. And as we walk out, I want to read our new memory verse over you guys. It is Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold unfervently to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Our God is faithful. That's a reminder for you today and for the rest of your week. Hope you have a great week, church. Come on.